Welcome once again to Dimensions of Prophecy. Our speaker is Pastor Kenneth Cox. I'm Brenda Wood. Tonight, Pastor Cox continues his presentation about the Holy Spirit with a thrilling topic, How to Receive the Baptism of the Holy Spirit. He spoke the other night about why many don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But tonight's topic deals with the subject of how to be baptized with God's Spirit. This special baptism has been promised to all who will reach out in faith and accept it. It's a gift God is willing to give to you and to me. So let's go immediately to join Pastor Kenneth Cox as he tells us step by step how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm very, very happy to welcome each of you. Last night I spent the evening with you on the subject of why people do not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people have prayed for it, sought the baptism of the Holy Spirit, never received it in their lives. And we looked last night at certain things that keep people from receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to look at the subject of how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Extremely important that you know and that you experience this in your life because there's a lot of Christians today that live ineffective Christian lives because they have never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The disciples had to learn that. You remember that with the death of Jesus, all the hopes, all the desires, the ambitions of those disciples died with Christ. The one they had believed to be the Messiah, the one they had thought that would usher in a new kingdom, now lay dead. They couldn't understand. Even though he told them he was going to die ahead of time, they still couldn't comprehend that. And then the word began to come across Jerusalem that he had risen. And all the joy and the hope again that kindled in their hearts that he had risen from the grave. Christ had given them the promise that when he would go away that he would send the Holy Spirit that it would comfort them, that it would be there for them. And I'd like for you to look at some of the promises that he gave them concerning the Holy Spirit. It says here in John 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your what? Advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. He said it's to your advantage that I go away because he said, if I don't go away, then the Holy Spirit won't come. And he says he needs to come and be with you. You see, with Christ, the Scripture speaks of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They have certain characteristics in common. One, they are omnipotent, all-powerful, all three of them. They are omniscient. They know all. They at one time, all three of them were omnipresent. They could be anywhere or everywhere at one time. But when Jesus said, listen, I'll take upon myself humanity. I will become one with the human race. I will become their brother. I'll take on to myself their form. He gave up his ability to be omnipresent, and he decided that he would take human form for eternity. Do you understand that? You know what that means? Have you ever looked at the sacrifice of Christ? It speaks of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We refer to that as the Godhead. The next order of life below that is what? Angels. And then the scripture says that man was created a little lower than the angels. So there's God, angels, man. So when Jesus said, listen, I'll become a human being, I'll take upon myself his form, he didn't take one step down, he took two steps down. He became a human being. Now, if you and I were going to make a similar type sacrifice, we'd have to take two steps down. The next order of life below us is what? Animals. Dogs, cats, horses, cows. That's one step. 
He didn't take one step. He took two. The next order of life would be insects. Are you willing? Are you willing to take on the form of a grasshopper? Oh, I'm not talking for a little while. I'm talking about for eternity. You willing to take on that form, die for them, and bear that form for eternity? That's the kind of sacrifice that Jesus made. And so he's telling these disciples, it's good. It's to your advantage that I go away because when I go away, the Holy Spirit can come and he can be with every one of you, any place, any time. He can be right by your side. Gave that promise. He also said, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit that prompts you, that guides you, that leads you into the truth of God's word. I've got to be willing to open up my heart, study it. And as I do, it says the Holy Spirit will lead me into all truth. It also says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you, what? Forever. Any place I go, any time, the Holy Spirit can be with me, guiding, directing, leading my life. One other text here says, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be what? In you. So the Holy Spirit promises to go with you. It doesn't make any difference where you are. You can be in prison and have the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's marvelous. You never have to be lonesome the Holy Spirit can always be with you, right there to comfort, to guide, direct. I'm so thankful. You know, the Scripture says that the angels have keys to every prison on earth. There's not a prison that the angels can't get into. There's not a prison the Holy Spirit can't get into. Be there. Guide us, direct us, lead us. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what it was given for. Now, what we want to look at is we want to find out what the Holy Spirit does for us. It says that he does certain things. It helps us testify of Jesus Christ. It says, but when he, the helper, comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will what? Testify of me. The Holy Spirit will always lift up Jesus Christ. Always. The Holy Spirit will always exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. It will never exalt the man. Anytime you see it exalting the man, there's something wrong. It will exalt Jesus Christ. I've been here preaching to you now for three weeks. Learn to love all of you. But I want to tell you something. When a Western Union messenger, boy, comes to your house with a message. Let me ask you, what are you the most interested in, Western Union boy or the message? The message. That ha that's all I am is a Western Union boy, nothing more. That's all. It's the message that counts. And it says that we are to uplift and the Holy Spirit will lift up Jesus Christ always will testify of him. Secondly, we also found in our study that it will give to us the fruits of the Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to give us the fruits of the Spirit. You remember them, don't you? Fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These gifts, by, their, by the way, there are nine gifts of the Spirit and there's nine fruits of the Spirit. Okay, it says that he gives to us Peace, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So it says that he gives us peace. Did you read the text carefully? Did you notice that there's two types of peace there? Read it carefully, folks. Peace I leave with you, 
My peace I give to you. You see, when he says, peace I leave with you, that's the kind of peace he was talking about when the angels sang there on the plains of Bethlehem and they said, peace on earth. That's that kind of peace. He said, my peace I leave with you. He said, I want things to be peaceful around you. I want it to be nice. I want you to have peace. But he said, more than that, my peace I give unto you. That means when the whole world's falling apart all around me, I can have peace within my soul. Two different types. My peace I give unto you. Also, wants to give you joy. These things have I spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So he says that he wants us to give us joy. And dear friend, your relationship with Jesus Christ should make you happy. If it doesn't, there's something wrong. Your relationship with Jesus Christ, the joy that he gives you, should make you sing in the bathtub, in the shower. If it doesn't, there's something wrong. He wants to give us joy, wants us to be happy, enjoy life. So he gives to us the fruits of the Spirit. There's something else it does also. It says here, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be what? Witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, the Holy Spirit helps me testify of Christ. It gives me the fruits of the Spirit, and it empowers our witnessing. How does it empower our witnessing? It says that it gives gifts unto men. Listen. Therefore, he said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave what? Gifts to men. All right, what are those? And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And dear friend, that text is not talking about the clergy. I find people want to read that and they want to talk about that in terms of the clergy. No, it's not. It's talking about you. Every one of you have a ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says he gives you gifts to make that ministry effective. That's promises. Those gifts is what empowers our witnessing. It's what makes our witness effective. And God wants to give those to you. Now, that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. Let's see how you receive it. How can I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That's what we want to find out today. To begin with, I talked last night about things that you needed, that people did that kept them from receiving it. The way you receive it, one, is simply by examining yourself. Now, let me take just a little time with that. When I say examining yourself, all of us sometimes need to stop and just reflect a little bit on ourselves. I don't think you need to spend a lot of time doing that. It's bad. You see, self would rather be thought of badly than not to be thought of at all. So you, need, you don't need to dwell on yourself a lot. But the scripture does say, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread or drink that cup. There are times when I need to examine myself. I need to look. I need to ask myself, point blank, why do I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I need to just ask myself, why do I want to receive it? I need to make sure that my motivation is right. As I told you, you do not use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses you. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. It tells us to take heed unto yourselves. That means look at yourself. See, ask, your, ask yourself some questions. After I have examined myself, I know my motivation for what I'm doing is right. Then I need to renounce sin. Now, when I say renounce sin, don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about I need to just get something real clear in my mind. I need to make a decision whose side I'm on. Some people have never made that decision. You need to decide whose side are you on, the Lord's side or the devil's side. 
Whose side are you going to be with? I need to say, listen, I'm going to renounce sin. I'm going to place myself on the Lord's side. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. So Peter said, if you repent, in other words, you renounce sin, you say, I belong to the Lord, I've asked forgiveness of my sin, then what's going to happen? What? And you what? Might. No, it doesn't say might. It says will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's part of it. In other words, I accept that by faith. I accept the fact that I will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I need to renounce sin. I need to put that out of my life. It says if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, he does that simply. Not only must I renounce sin, but I also must submit to God. Now we're getting into the hard part. Most people, eh, that's fine. But the submitting part, that's a little different. But dear friend, if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you must submit to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be what? What? Dead. Can you sit it, submit any more than that? Huh? No, there, you can't submit any more than reckon yourself to be dead. Indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, I'm to turn my life over to the Lord. I'm to let him have his way with me. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. See, I must place myself in the hands of the Lord. And do not present your members as instruments of righteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead. Now, he's talking about total submission placing my life in his hands to be used by God as he wants to use me. That's what he's talking about. And if you're talking about receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that must be what happens in your life. Paul, he makes that real clear. I want you to just listen to how Paul refers to himself. This is how he talks about himself. Well, we should have a text there. We don't. But anyhow, the text in 1 Corinthians, he says that he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He said he is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. All right, Romans 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated the gospel of God. You see, he said, I am a prisoner. I am a servant, Jesus Christ. This is what he was. Total submission. This is what the scripture is talking about. Not only must I submit to God, but I want to share with you now, as far as I'm concerned, the clearest instruction in the Scripture as to how you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Strange text, but very, very true. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a strange analogy, isn't it? To say, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. What similarity is there between being drunk with wine and being filled with the Holy Spirit? Why would Paul use such an illustration? Say, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, when you sit down at the table and you begin to drink wine, as you drink wine, the more you drink, what becomes, what starts controlling you more? The wine. The more wine you drink, the more the wine controls. That's exactly what he's saying. He said, don't be drunk with wine, but let the Holy Spirit control your life. That's why he's using that comparison. And he says, when the Holy Spirit controls your life, certain things begin to happen. Listen to them. He says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, 
singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. He said that when Holy Spirit comes in your life, what's going to happen to you? You're going to what? Sing songs. Have a melody in your heart. That's, that's the joy that comes. That will take place. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it says that if we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're going to sing songs, we're going to be happy, we're going to have joy, we're going to give thanks. Now, I'm going to put two texts up there side by side. When I put those two texts up there, I want you to see the similarity between them. He says that's what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Let's see what he says. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. All right, now follow carefully. Colossians 3, verse 16. Now you remember, this verse is the next one. The first one I just read to you said, don't be drunk with wine which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the next verse after that. It says, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, this is what's going to happen to you, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Listen to this one in Colossians. And it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Okay, that's this, right? Huh? That's the scripture. It says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. When the Word of God dwells in you richly, let's see what's going to happen. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You see any comparison? Similarity? In fact, it says when the Word of God dwells in you richly, the same thing that the baptism of the Holy Spirit over here happens here. He continues on. The next verse in, in Ephesians says, verse 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The next verse here in Colossians, verse 17, says whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In other words, it says that in both cases, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to praise the Lord and you're going to give thanks. Given thanks lately? Huh? Had any prayers of thanksgiving lately? You taking any time just to talk to the Lord and thank Him for what He's done for you? You thanked Him for some of the bad things that have happened? Oh, huh, no. Yeah, it says you're to thank Him for all things, the bad and the good. You need to be taking some time to thank the Lord. It says that when you do that, when you let the Word of God dwell in you richly, you will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read you two quotations, favorites of mine. I'd like for you to listen to what it says. It's talking about Jesus. It's from a book called Christ Object Lessons. Listen very carefully. It says, from the hours spent with God, that's from the hours Jesus spent with God, he, Jesus, came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. How often did he receive it? Daily. Let me tell you something, dear friend. This thing that I hear preached where somebody receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they act like that that's a one-time experience, forget it. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a daily occurrence. Our Lord and Savior received a daily baptism of the Holy Spirit, so you and I must spend time in this book. I need a daily baptism of His Spirit into my life. Not just once, but every day that must go on. So if you're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to submit your life to God. Also, it says that if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you've got to ask for it. A lot of people never ask for it. Never say anything about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Never pray to God for it. They never receive it because they never ask. We still got that same problem, but I guess we'll live with it. Luke 11, verse 13, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, 
How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You see, it says that if you and I ask for it, he will give us the Holy Spirit. So I've got to be willing to ask. Now, maybe I should tell you that the asking has something to do with the attitude. You understand what I'm saying? Asking has a lot to do with the attitude. A lot of people don't understand that. If you're using God as a Santa Claus, I doubt very seriously whether you're going to get very much. But if you have a relationship with him, if you spend time with him, if you have something there where you know him personally, then ask, he says, and ye shall receive. Makes a great, great difference. Now, folks, I told you the other night, and I can't emphasize this enough in this subject, you can't always believe what you see. You can't always believe what you hear. And I find people running out because there's some excitement going on someplace, and they're running out there and they say, oh, we're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're asking to be deceived. That's what you're asking to be. Listen to what it says here in Revelation. For they are the spirits of what? Demons working signs which go out to the kings of the whole earth and of the whole world, the earth and the whole world, together in the battle of the great day of God Almighty. It says that the devil and his angels can work miracles. So don't go out looking for a miracle. That isn't the way you receive it. These people that want to talk about how people are out of control, they don't know what they're doing when they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, nothing could be farther from the truth. The Scripture says this, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the what? The prophets. That means they're not out of control. God doesn't do that kind of thing. In other words, yes, I need to come to him, I need to get on my knees, and I need to ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I need it to come into my life in a special way. But dear friend, let me tell you, you don't get it by just running out after some big thing that's going on. Now, I'm going to share with you probably the best statement that I know of in, in Christian literature anywhere of how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen carefully to what it says. It's taken from a book called Desire of Ages. Listen carefully. Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to his church. And the promise belongs to us as much as to the first disciples. But like every other promise, it is given on what? Conditions. All promises are given on conditions. Okay, let's see what the conditions are. There are many who believe and profess to claim the Lord's promise. They talk about Christ and about the Holy Spirit, yet receive no benefit. People that talk about it, but far as seeing any benefit, they don't. They do not what? Surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agency. Ah, if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to surrender the soul to be guided and directed by the Holy Spirit. We cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is to use us. Though the Spirit... Through the Spirit, God works in His people to will and do His good pleasure. But many will not submit to this. They want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. What? This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for His guidance and grace, is the Spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promised blessing claimed by faith brings all other blessings in its what? Train. Did you get what that said? This promised blessing, the blessing of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
brings with it all other blessings? You've been missing out on some blessings? Huh? There's an answer. It, it is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and he is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive it. Oh, it says he's there, ready to supply every individual with his capacity to receive it. In other words, if you're willing to open up your heart, it says that God will give you the Holy Spirit in great, great measure. If you and I are willing first to examine ourselves, if we are willing to renounce sin, if I'm willing to submit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and I ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I will receive it into my life. In the southern part of our country, back in the days of slavery, there was a man who owned a plantation. On that plantation, he had a large number of slaves. Among those slaves, there was an old man that was a Christian. The plantation owner was a mean, ornery old man had no use for anybody or anything. But this old slave lived a good Christian life. And that man knew that that old man was a Christian. And one day the plantation owner got sick. Days ro rolled on, he didn't get any better. And the old plantation owner realized he was dying realized that time was running out for him. And he called in the slave and he said, listen, I'm dying. He said, I probably only have a few days left. I'm lost. If I die, I know I'm a lost man. Tell me what I've got to do to be saved. Tell me what I've got to do so I won't be lost. The old plantation, the old slave told the plantation owner, you got to go with me out to the hog pen. Kneel down in the hog pen and pray with me. And the old plantation owner said, what? He said, you're going to have to go out in the hog pen and kneel down with me and pray. He said, I'm not doing any such thing. And the slave walked out of the room. The next day, the old man wasn't any better. In fact, he was weaker. Called for the slave. He said, listen. He said, I know that I'm not going to make it. I know that my time is limited, and I'm lost. I'm lost. I, I need to be saved. Tell me what i got to do to be saved. And the slave said, you got to go out in the pig pen. Kneel down with me out in the pig pen and pray. And the pride of that old plantation owner swelled up and he said, I'm not going to do it. The slave walked out of the room. The third day, the plantation owner called him in and he said, listen, I'm weaker. He said, it's only a matter, a short matter of time. And he said, I'm lost. Lost, I've done a lot of bad things. I don't want to be lost. I want to be saved. Tell me what i got to do to be saved. The slave said, you got to go out in the pig pen. You're going to have to kneel down there in that pig pen and pray with me. And the plantation owner said, you can't. And the slave said, you got to go out there and kneel in that hog pen and pray. And you could see the struggle that was going on in the soul of that plantation owner as he was fighting all of his pride. And finally, he just sunk back into the pillow. He said, okay, let's go, help me. And the old slave said, you don't have to go, but you've got to be willing. And dear friend, that's what it's about. You've got to be willing. You've got to surrender. You can't go on in all your pride. You can't go in in all your selfishness and all and make it. You can't do it. 
You'll never receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit unless you and I are just willing to open our hearts and our souls and let the Holy Spirit come in and fill us. Only then. Then He can use you. Can't use you. As long as you're going to run your own life. Can't use you as long as you're going to call the shots. Only when you're willing to submit it to Him and say, Yes, Lord, have my life use me then God will give you the Holy Spirit let us pray Heavenly Father we thank you so much for the marvelous promises of thy word thankful Lord for the hope that we have in Christ thankful for the Holy Spirit we ask that each one of us here today may simply lay everything on the altar, surrender our lives, and be filled with the Holy Spirit.